Fire Emblem Fates Conquest is regarded as one of the most difficult games in the series, forcing the player to constantly scrape by with limited money and EXP. On Lunatic, the hardest difficulty, enemies are in greater numbers and have overpowered skills solely meant to spite you, and can turn one unlucky slip-up into a game over. Fortunately, you can always reload your save and try again, but what if your progress is never saved? Well. That's what me and my customized protagonist Cornmill are gonna find out. After waking up from a dream where Cornmill fights against the Crown Prince of Nor, his older brother Xander, Cornmill fights against the Crown Prince of Nor, his older brother Xander. Unlike the open field setting of his dream, they fight on an unstable roof that Xander's horse can barely balance on, giving Cornmill the advantage in the fight. The rest of the Norian royal family comes to congratulate their brother's win. Leo, the diligent intellectual, Camilla, the doting older sister who may have inspired Cornmill's design, and little Elise, who is specified to be technically an adult. Even though the fight was rigged in Cornmill's favor, his victory has earned him the right to see his father in the capital. King Garen gives his son a sword that definitely doesn't have a couple kilograms of gunpowder in it, and releases some Hoshidan prisoners for Cornmill and his retainers to take down. This map introduces Dragon Veins, tiles that cause special effects on the map, but can only be activated by characters with royal blood. While Gunter charges ahead to dispatch the samurai, Cornmill and his maid Felicia hold down the fort against Rinka's squadron. After uppercutting Kaze with the Ganglari, Garen orders for the prisoner's execution, but do no wrong Cornmill will not allow it. Before Daddy has the chance to process this act of defiance, Leo defuses the situation by pulling the trigger himself. Garen is satisfied enough with this outcome, but Leo only knocked them unconscious, in order to make Cornmill happy and let him secretly release Kaze and Rinka into the wild. In Chapter 3, in order to earn back Garen's love and trust, Cornmill is ordered to take his pet berserker, Hans, on a walk. <coughs> Xander warns us of Hans's aggressive tendencies, but King Garen assures us that he doesn't bite. We take Hans to his favorite spot by the bottomless canyon, but we run into a Hoshidan force occupying a fortress. Cornmill decides to avoid confrontation, but Hans breaks free from his leash and starts an international conflict, leaving Cornmill, Felicia, and Gunter to clean up his mess. The victory condition is just to seize the fort in the south, but I opt to engage the northern enemies to squeeze a bit more EXP out of the map. Unfortunately, I get humbled by the pair-up system. I first overestimate Gunter's defensive profile to get him dual-striked into oblivion, then proceed to miscount how much shield gauge I have, which results in Felicia's demise. I try to salvage with just Cornmill, but my hope in this run has withered, and thus marks the end of Attempt 1. For Attempt 2, I forgo the character customization options and create a default male Corrin. I bestow him a plus magic boon and minus res bane, enhancing his offenses with dragonstones and eventually tomes, while fully accepting the poor res growth he'll have anyway. I give him a ninja talent, which won't be used by him, but is rather for a certain special someone. Or, more accurately, some too. We go through the same exact song and dance as before. Wake up to Felicia, beat up Xander on the roof, get Gunther killed in Chapter 2. Ooh, wait, that wasn't supposed to happen. We return to Chapter 3, though this time only with Corin and Felicia. Thanks to the Iron Dagger's 1-2 range, Felicia can take refuge in the fort and generate enough shield gauge to survive against and fend off the initial wave of archers. After spending a copious amount of turns healing her in the fort, Felicia can whittle down Omozu enough for Corrin to get a coin flip kill, and I promptly leave before I consider trying to fight the northern enemies again. Corrin finds Gunter trying to get Hans back on his leash, but Hans roughhouses a little too much and knocks the weakened Gunter off the bridge. Corrin gets so mad that his body mutates into strange shapes, which rightfully scares off Hans. As if things couldn't get weirder, an absurd sequence of events takes place that involves plummeting into the bottomless canyon, getting rescued by a bird, and being brought into the astral realm, but all of this was just some crazy concussion-induced hallucination. In Chapter 4, Korn is dragged to the capital of Hoshido and is brought before Queen Makoto, who claims to be his birth mother. She explains that Korn was born into the Hoshidan royal family, but was kidnapped by King Garen and raised in Nor many years ago. She sends Rayoma and Korin out on a brotherly bonding exercise to save Hinoka and Sakura from hordes of the Faceless, monsters summoned by Norian Dark Mages and to attack Hoshido. This map involves leveling mountains with dragon vans, while Rayoma follows closely beside his brother to steal kills from him, instead of, like, actually rushing ahead to save his sisters. 
Sorry, Sakura. After a heartfelt reunion, Corrin hears a woman singing the main theme of the game and is introduced to Azura, a Norian princess who was counter-kidnapped after Corrin was taken. Apparently, the Hoshidan forces gave up on getting Corrin back since he was too heavily guarded, so they just took Azura to come back home with... something. Chapter 5 is called Mother. Ah, perhaps we'll just have a fun day bonding with Nakoda during the festive... Oh. Now that Korin is no longer weighed down from the burden of having alive parents, he reaches his full potential as a Fire Emblem protagonist and goes on a tear as a feral dragon. Despite Korin's enhanced stats in this form, he can't survive the battle without Sakura to heal and reduce damage, Azura to dance and restore actions, and Kaze pair with Renka to fend off the mages. Meanwhile, Ryoma duels the Invisible Man that stole and blew up Korin's sword. Though he eventually loses, Ryoma wears him down enough for Korin to finish the map. Once Korin calms down, he regains his memories and recalls that King Garen did in fact kidnap him, thus verifying his late mother's claims. While his moody younger brother Takumi is busy having a tantrum, Korin is brought before the Divine Sword Yato. The blade chooses its wielder to bring peace to the world, and is the physical embodiment of moral superiority justifying every decision Korn will make, and invalidating any criticism against him, no matter how warranted or deserved it may be. Chapter 6 is the Branch of Fate, where the player must choose their allegiance and decide which route to play. You can choose to stay with your not-really-blood-related, blood-related family by defending Hoshido and the Birthright route, remain loyal to your unambiguously not-blood-related adopted family and fight with Nor and the Conquest route, or abandon both families and become a centrist to find invisible people in the Revelations route. I decide I want to actually have fun and play well-designed maps, which leaves me with a single option. The Hoshidan siblings do not take too kindly to this decision, and conclude the logical course of action is to kill the Norians and literally knock some sense into Korin. Victory is achieved by defeating four out of the five enemies. Takami, Hinoka, and Yukimura can all easily be baited in by Leo, leaving them open and vulnerable to be cleaned up by the rest of my units. I need only defeat one more enemy, and since Xander's not landing a hit on Rayoma anytime soon, I turn my attention towards the defenseless Sakura and bully her for a grand reward of 6 experience points. Sorry, Sakura. In Chapter 7 of Fire Emblem Fates Conquest, Korin returns to Nor, which completely surprises King Garen and his advisor Iago, who suspects Korin's motives. Korin recounts the events in Hoshido, and asks if Garen planned the explosion from the sword he gave Korin as an elaborate scheme to kill Queen Makoto. He says no, which clears his name of any wrongdoing and suspicion whatsoever. Phew, that was a phrase could be evil or something. Before Korin is accepted back into the royal family, Daddy Deer sends him on a solo op to suppress the Ice Tribe Rebellion. On his way there, he gets surrounded by a pack of aggressive faceless, but Felicia arrives as a timely reinforcement to bail him out of this sticky situation. Through the combined support of a defense tonic and Felicia's skills, devoted partner and demoiselle, Korin has enough defense to reduce damage to zero for most of the Faceless, which is important since all the foes have out-of-combat damage skills like Grizzly Wound, that will eventually wear Korin down to 1 HP. After obtaining a few more reinforcements in the form of Silas, Elise, Effie, and Arthur, I make a break for the north in order to create a choke point on the bridge. Korin eliminates the northern half of the pincer, while a buffed Effie nullifies attacks from the south, which gives me breathing room and complete control over the map. In Chapter 8, the group marches through a blizzard towards the Ice Trap Village, but Korin's barefooted feet freeze, which causes him to topple over. Fortunately, he is spotted and saved by the Ice Trap leader Kilma, who also happens to be Flora and Felicia's father. Elise lets slip that we were ordered to suppress their rebellion, making Kilma think there was all some convoluted Trojan horse scheme that allowed Korin's retinue to infiltrate their village. The Ice Tribe takes up arms to kill Korin, with even more enemies held within the houses, but we can stifle the reinforcements and receive a gold reward by visiting the houses before the opposing lancers do. The top right houses are a lost cause, so with Odin and Niles as some added muscle, I push left towards Flora. Elise buys me an extra turn by freezing the lancer, and I rush in with Effie and Silas to take down Flora, before she gives my army a taste of her own freeze staff. I could just wait until next turn to finish her off, but my chat encourages me to give Arthur a chance to defeat Flora now. But he misses and gets crit in return. Which, if nothing else, is at least the most on-brand thing to happen to him. 
through the graces of circumstance, justice reigns! And Arthur doesn't get murdered by Flora on the enemy phase. So I take the 100% hit with Effie before Flora can permanently reign on my justice parade. Once I get the maximum gold reward by visiting three houses, I train my army against the remaining enemies and let Felicia and Kilma have some nice daughter-father bonding time. With the battle won, the game retroactively confirms Korin killed no one, which is a common theme throughout Conquest's story. Kilma is impressed by Korin's passivity, gives Korin his word that the Ice Tribe will stop their rebellion, and gives Korin his blessing to marry any of his daughters. Flora re-swears her fealty to Corrin, but will only join him on the condition that he has a level 3 fire orb in his Astral Dimension headquarters, even though she would have no knowledge of the Astral Realm, nor would she even be able to use the fire orb in her base class. Great. Since Corrin did not suppress the Ice Tribe Rebellion alone, Garen sends him off on another errand to prove himself. Before he can conquer Notre Dame Gas, Corrin must first pass through Fort Dragonfall, named after a dragon who fell and became a fort. Along with a sassy, lost child, Azura is here, but is trapped on the right side of the map and must avoid enemy detection lest they rip her to shreds. Meanwhile, the rest of my army continues to infiltrate the fort. Courtesy of Felicia's support and his magic boon, Corrin can actually one-shot most of the opposition with the Dragonstone. Between chapters in the My Castle, I obtain an umbrella, a one might sword with 1 to 2 range. While undoubtedly a joke weapon, the umbrella is actually pretty good giving Corrin the ability to fight ranged enemies and can even still crit or proc defensive skills. We fight our way to the boss, Hitaka, who is quite strong with powerful skills like rally defense. Niles can use the capture command to bring him to our prison, where Hitaka can be bribed to defect and fight against his home country for a small fortune of 17 wheat. Before trying the infamous Conquest Chapter 10, we travel to a small village besieged by the Faceless. The only survivors are a village girl named Mozu and her mother. The only survivor is a village girl named Mozu. Korn's dead mother sense tingles, so he rushes to the scene to rescue this new Fire Emblem protagonist. After we recruit Mozu by sharing dead mother stories, I spend the rest of the paralogue training her with dual strikes, since she can't deal any damage herself. Although she starts weak, her enhanced growth rates and unique class set can mold her into the most reliable final boss slayer for the end game. I also take the opportunity to train Elise up to level 10, so I can promote her to a strategist and give her access to tomes, making her my second strategist alongside a heart-sealed Felicia. Speaking of hearts and Felicia, Corrin and Felicia already have enough support to achieve S rank and get hitched. This further augments their already phenomenal synergy in battle, but the main reason I push for this marriage is for Felicia to gain access to the ninja class line through Corrin's selected talent, but that will come into play later. In Chapter 10, Takumi and two ships worth of Hoshidans arrive to take over the Norian-controlled Port Dia, so Korin and Co. must defend and prevent enemies from reaching the Green Tiles for 11 turns. This is one of the most tightly and well-designed maps in the entire series, but it's also brutally difficult, acting as a gatekeeper from the rest of the Conquest route. There are droves of enemies and a plethora of reinforcements in turns to come, so I separate my army to defend different choke points. The newlyweds stay in the center, and are strong enough to kill the Oni savages before they can activate Lunge and break through, and Effie takes her boyfriend Silas to the bridge on the right and acts as a barricade between the enemy archers and the Ballista. A group comprising spearfighters and ninja bursts through a breakable wall and create a new opening, but Camilla and her retainers come to our rescue. Mommy's here. Thanks to Camilla's huge, massive stats, she can defeat every enemy on the map in a single round of combat. Selina uses Arthur as a backpack to get some additional oomph against the Western Oni savages, and Elise and Baruka work together to take down the flyers that get uncomfortably close to the defend tiles. Since Azura and Niles have afforded me a turn of respite, Corrin and Felicia move ahead to fight Abora early, before reinforcements come to her side and she becomes aggressive of her own volition. While Abora is a little preoccupied, I have time to visit the rest of the houses, picking up some important loot like the Duel Club. Unfortunately, Takumi notices I'm a bit too relaxed and activates a Dragon Bane, which drains the water from the moat and makes the area traversable by grounded units, effectively eliminating my choke points. Camilla can utilize the Dual Club to gain Weapon Triangle advantage and dispose of Hinata, which only leaves a few waves of grunts to deal with. I maintain complete control over the map, keeping up the offensive without needing to hunker down, and the map ends with just a mere 7 enemies left on the field. Chapter 11 is a much-needed moment of relief, 
as the gang fights against isolated groups of enemies that are all neatly separated in their own rooms. The enemies have some scary skills, like counter or life and death, but I can make use of the stairs to run away. Enemies are stuck in the rooms they're in, cannot use the stairs like my army can, so I can literally disengage whenever I want, and I cannot get overwhelmed unless I let it happen. Since the map allows me to be as degenerate as I please, I can leisurely train Mozu in the art of archery, and over the course of the map, she goes from a trainee that requires constant babysitting in order to function, to a decent bow user whose offenses are now on par with Niles. The entire premise of Chapter 12 stems from Garen wanting to make his son suffer, because it builds character, I guess. So Iago concocts an absurdly complicated scheme that involves... 1. Infecting Elise with a terminal illness in which she only has a couple hours to live. 2. Ordering Corrin's army to take a rest in Makareth, which just so happens to have a pharmacy stocked with the medicine needed to cure Elise. And 3. Convincing Ryelma, who is effectively the king of Oshido, to enter this Norian-controlled territory because Corrin will supposedly be there, and coincidentally have Ryelma obstruct Corrin from letting him save his youngest sister. Iago somehow had the power and influence to bring all of this into fruition for this chapter's conflict to exist at all. Since Elise cannot be deployed for this map on account of being mortally diseased, I had the prescience to capture Miyabi, a generic shrine maiden from the last map, so I'll have another staff user besides Felicia. Elise will wait patiently for 16 turns before kicking the bucket, so we must either escape or defeat Ryoma within that time frame. In order to make progress, we must break medicine and poison pots that can either buff or debuff nearby units. All of the pot bonuses and a clutch freeze from Mayabi lets my units make quick work of the mid-bosses, Saizo and Kagero. I make the most of the newly recruited Perry and Laszlo to perform mundane tasks, such as acting as a canary in the coal mine or using their bodies to trap enemy apothecaries. With three turns left and Effie blocking all of the reinforcements, I decide to try my hand at fighting Ryoma. On the final turn, Mozu is able to get a hit in and survive a counterattack thanks to all the pot she was exposed to numbing her senses, which sets Camilla up with a shaky 70% kill, letting us enter the pharmacy and just barely save Elise's life. In Chapter 13, King Garen sends Corrin off yet again to deal with yet another rebellion. Upon arriving in Chiv, we find that Takami and a bunch of Hoshidans have bolstered the ranks of the Chivoy Rebellion. Before the fight even begins, Takami shoots Elise, who's only recently discharged from the hospital, because the poor girl just can't catch a break these days. The map begins with a wave of Wyvern Rider Armor Knight pair-ups that charge your army's starting position. Camilla can intercept on the river and smite two of the Wyvern Riders with Zeo, forcibly dropping their supporting knight on the other side of the water, and reducing the flying onslaught that our new Armor Knight friend Benny has to take on at once. The rest of the map consists of individually provoking each of the four squadrons led by named characters, starting with Orochi on the left. Somewhere along the way of trying and failing to use the newly recruited Charlotte by attempting to proc on Mask against Reyna and Scarlet, Felicia reaches level 15 and learns Inspiration, the final skill of the Strategist class. Felicia and Jacob are special promoted units that let them gain access to promoted class skills far earlier than the rest of the cast would. With the Partner Seal, Felicia can access her spouse's ninja class line, and she reclasses into a Mechanist. Although she loses her ability to wield tomes, she can still hit with magical damage using the Flame Shuriken, thanks to her regained access to daggers and shuriken. Although we have achieved victory without killing any of the opposition, Hans and the Norian army arrive, and have the exact opposite plan. When confronted, Hans tells Corrin he's just following King Garen's orders to kill everyone in chief. Despite the fact Garen has unequivocally ordered the deaths and murders of a person or group numerous times by this point in the game, Corrin is in utter disbelief that his father would ever give out such a command. In Chapter 14, King Garen has planned a family outing in Circensia to watch a show. A mysterious dancer, whose identity cannot possibly be discerned, takes the stage. As her performance continues, water fills the air and also King Garen's lungs as he starts to have pneumonia-induced groans of discomfort. Suddenly, a group of Hoshidans led by Kumagera appear and are after the Norian King's head. Amidst the chaos, the performing dancer vanishes from the stage, but oh hey, Azura's back. She had been missing since the show started, so how nice and completely unrelated that she has returned. Leo joins Corrin's army, and he can charge ahead and dispose of the Hexengrod Shrine Maidens, while also tanking hits from and laying waste to the archers on the stage, thus nullifying their lunge attacks. We also recruit Keaton, a shapeshifter who can take the form of a wolf... thing... 
and has effective damage against beast units. After many turns of awkward progression caused by all the boats and water, I can get Niles to Kumagera, who, like Hitaka, is another strong capturable boss. With the capture mechanic in mind, I decided to capture Kanan, another generic shrine leader. Unlike Mayabi, who at least had some semblance of purpose by replacing Elise in Chapter 12, Kanan was captured just for the sake of novelty, which thus marks the beginning of Niles' side quest to capture any shrine maidens I come across. With the threat against King Garen's life handled, he turns his attention towards the disappearing dancer. Following Rabies protocol, Garen orders us to kill every performer in the immediate area, since one of them ought to be the perpetrator. Though we must reluctantly participate in this hunt, Leo devises a plan to cause a distraction and buy the dancer's time to make their escapes. His tome, Brynhildr, shines a mystical light that infuses the Yato with power, transforming it into the Grim Yato. However, despite all the fanfare, both the sword and Leo will be benched and never be seriously used again. Throughout the game, I've been marrying pairs of units together to make child characters. These children are put into deep realms, a place where time passes faster and, in the blink of an eye, turns literal infants to adolescents old enough to be drafted into the war effort. The first child I collect is Sophie, Silas and Effie's daughter, who finds herself fighting against a group of ruffians led by Nickel. Charge! Sophie is a stark upgrade over her father, boasting great strength and speed thanks to inheriting Effie's growths though she also inherited her mother's lack of pants. Fortunately, she can channel her partial nudity into her attacks, through her personal skill Mischievous, which strips her opponents of their clothing. Both the child and the enemies within a child paralog scale with your story progress, which makes them a great, and only, source of extra EXP, resources, and support in the conquest route. Before I finish the map, I capture Nicol, and also an impressive generic wyvern lord named Virgil, whose stats are about on par with Xander. Although not my intention, I coincidentally save five of the six green units, and am rewarded with a partner seal for Felicia and an energy drop to patch up Mozu's middling strength. In Chapter 15, Korn goes on a walk to get lost in his thoughts all on his lonesome, but gets interrupted by Azura singing Lost in Thoughts All Alone while she becomes transparent in the lake. Wanting to learn the ways of invisibility, he chases after her, but gets caught in a riptide and is transported to another location, where the two of them are ambushed by some purple guys. Surprisingly, an alive Gunter appears to assist us, somehow still drawing breath despite both the stories and my own best efforts to kill the old man. I cannot deploy anyone besides these three, and I'm on a 20 turn time limit to either escape or defeat the boss. In order to reach the boss, I must use this map's Dragon Vein to create replicas of each of my units. Stats, damage, status effects, skills, and inventories are shared between the source and clone, so healing Gunter's replica also heals Gunter, for instance. The main reason I did Sophie's paralog before this chapter was to get Corrin to level 20 and promote into a Nor Noble, which gives him access to tomes. With a forged plus two fire tome I named Akalad, Corrin can easily kill every enemy on the map, courtesy of his newfound 1-2 range magic damage. Although he only receives one experience point for kill, Korn is able to train his tome proficiency up to D rank, and I finish the map with 10 turns to spare. After quoting his wife and jumping into a canyon, Here goes nothing! Korn returns home and has a little chat with Azura. Although she won't divulge any details of where we just were because we're a broke bitch who didn't pay $20 for the revelation route, Azura tells Corrin that the only way to obtain peace is to kill King Garen. She explains that Garen's soul has been corrupted by some evil entity, which she quote unquote proves with a snow globe that has a lenticular image of Garen. Unfortunately, he is so ugly that the snow globe shatters, but Corrin is convinced. In order to reveal Garen's true form, we must make him sit on Hoshido's throne, which is a narratively convenient way to morally justify the conquest of a peaceful nation. In Chapter 16, Xander finally joins up with Corrin's army. With the Norian royal siblings all assembled, we set sail on our way to invade Hoshido, but the voyage is interrupted by pirates. The boss is masquerading as one of the four green units scattered around the map, always revealing himself to be the last one we talk to. We literally cannot afford to dawdle, as the pirates will steal 300 gold per turn. Sophie temporarily reclasses into a mercenary. She'll learn strong merc and hero skills to enhance her fighting prowess, but more importantly, she puts on some pants. Speaking of skills, Felicia reaches level 19 and learns the final mechanist skill, Replicate, a command that lets her create her own replica at will, 
sharing the same exact properties as the replicas from the chapter prior. While having a wife that can clone yourself has incredible benefits at home. Didn't expect that, did ya? Corn can also benefit on the battlefield, such as gaining the buffs from Inspiration, Demo Zeal, and Rally Resistance from Replica Felicia standing within two spaces of him, while also receiving the S rank stat bonuses and devoted partner buff from the real Felicia pairing up with him. Eventually, we reach the fourth green unit. Sophie uses her undressing umbrella to rip away his disguise and the rest of his clothing, which unveils him as the boss, Shura. After a bit of exposition and conversation, Shura is willing to pledge himself to our cause, but the Norian siblings express concern that he may be too dangerous to keep alive, and so the player is presented with a choice. If Korn spares Shura's life, he will join our army without any consequence, but Korn recalls Shura's naked body and how his skin would be the perfect material for some shoes. Hence, I decide to kill Shura. Wait, what? Fashioning his hide into a pair of boots, and let me fill the negative space in my yet-to-be-used death tracker at the bottom of my stream layout. In Chapter 17, Korin meets with Kotaro, the Norlai Daimyo of Mokushu. He grants us passage through his territory to reach Hoshido, but Saizo appears and claims that Kotaro has done the unforgivable act of... Uh... Taking a single hostage. Appalled by such a heinous offense, Korin's group joins forces with Saizo to rescue Kagero and kill Kotaro for his crime against humanity. This map is filled with countless ninja and debilitating Caltrop terrain. The Caltrops only harm units without the Lock Touch skill, so literally every enemy on this map has it, even the immobile Shrine Maiden, Yukari, who I capture as a prisoner. Oh, but this isn't hypocritical, and is completely different from a Kotaro did because he is not Korin. Beyond adding a third Shrine Man to his collection, Niles is strong and fast enough to shoot down the Ninja and Master Ninja in a single bout of combat. Mechanists and Automatons also populate the area, but Felicia and Felicia can dismantle them with effective damage granted by the Golem Bane skill. As long as I take my time and don't rush ahead, the chapter is not that bad, and Kotaro finally falls after I land enough low accuracy attacks on him. Once Kagero is saved and reunited with Saizo, we send them off so they can cause problems for us later. In Chapter 18, Korin's army enters the neutral territory of Izumo for some rest and relaxation. To the Norian royal family's surprise, the Hoshiden royal family has also traveled here for the same reason. A fight between Xander and Ryoma almost breaks out, but Archduke Izana reminds them of his realm's strict no PvP rule. The royals oblige and put away their weapons, lest they get kicked from the server. Just then, a group of Norian soldiers appear and seize the unarmed Hoshidans. Archduke Izana reveals himself as Zola, a Norian dark mage who impersonated the real Archduke to capture the Hoshidans and earn King Garen's favor. Although this would quickly and efficiently end the war, Korin and Xander cannot abide such a dishonorable victory, so we fight against Zola in order to free the Hoshidan royal family. We are on a 20 turn time limit to defeat Zola in the north and the two generals in the south. The map is teeming with status staff users, so I rush Benny ahead to kill the nearby free staff strategists, and non-combatants like Arthur are put in the maids and feeble staff range to deplete their uses. While I cut a path towards Zola through the droves of heroes and sorcerers, Niles continues his side quest by capturing Rami the Maid, since she's the closest thing to a shrine maiden on this map. Though quite battered and bruised, my army manages to vanquish Zola and the enemies surrounding him with a little less than half my turns remaining. Fortunately, I am able to reach the southern bosses in time, and even have the opportunity to capture them through the combined efforts of Camilla's hammer and Niles' shining bow. As established in the last two chapters, the only thing Korin's army hates more than people who wear disguises or take hostages is people who wear disguises and take hostages, and so Zola is ultra-executed by Leo. Once Ryoma, Hinoka, Takami, and Sakura are saved and reunited with one another, we send them off so they can cause problems for us later. In Chapter 19, the gang marches through the mountains that are home to the Kitsune, a race of shapeshifters capable of transforming into foxes and ninetales. We encroach on a hamlet of Kitsune led by Kaden, who mistake us as poachers after their fur, and a battle ensues. Not only are the Kitsune strong, they can literally fade in and out of existence every other turn, preventing them from attacking or being attacked. This illusion gimmick coupled with their naturally high avoidance makes this map extremely threatening, so I opt to cheese it by deploying all my flyers. They can ferry my units and hide on top of the mountain, which is an area the Kitsune physically can't reach. 
The only unit who can safely fight the furries directly and live to tell the tale is Benny, but I don't want him hogging all the experience. With some careful positioning, I can bait the enemies toward the mountain, which lets me grind levels and bow weapon rank with Kinshi Knight Mozu. Everything goes smoothly, weaving in and out of the mountains to goad packs of enemies into approaching. I tried to use the map shortcut to pair Elise into Camilla, but I didn't realize Camilla wasn't at full health, so Elise instead prioritizes healing her, which leaves her as easy prey in range of 9 deadly Kitsune. This is kinda bad, because she's almost able to marry Odin and Mother Ophelia, and her paralogue is crucial to my strategy for the final chapters. As you can clearly tell from my face, I am undaunted and remain stoic in facing this new challenge of saving Elise. I position all my units around Elise, thus preventing the Kitsune from targeting her. Elise's Lily's poise reduces damage taken by 3 for all adjacent allies, affecting everyone but Virgil, who remains separated in order to prevent enemies from overwhelming Sophie. Fortunately, I only face half the enemies per turn since they're on alternating illusion cycles. I heal my units with vulneraries to prepare for the next turn, which actually saves Virgil's life, as he would have died with perfect damage otherwise. Camilla has actually been able to double and kill the enemies who attacked her on enemy phase, meaning enemy numbers have dwindled enough for me to go on the offensive. Now that I'm in the clear, I take no more chances and just let Benny root the rest of the map. Disregarding the minor heart attack, this experience was pretty beneficial since Sophie leveled up enough to learn soul, so I reclass her into a paladin and reunite her with her steed, Avil. This decision was not made lightly as she no longer wears pants, because riding a horse and being fully clothed are mutually exclusive, I guess. In chapter 20, we must venture through the Wind Tribe village, but we are obstructed by Aang from Avatar The Last Airbender. He'll only let us pass if we can defeat him and his band of benders, who will bend our bones into breaking. This map's gimmick is Gusts of Winds that deplaces my units up or down 5 spaces, which can isolate my team and send them into precarious situations if I'm not careful. Opposing flying enemies approach to harry my team, but Mozu can intercept with a mini belt and fell them with relative ease courtesy of air superiority. The next group of flyers are tied to Hayato, so I use Virgil to take the Hexengrave hit and draw in the flock of Axebreaker Falcon Knights. Once Hayato wastes the rest of his Hexengrave's durability on Kian and Elise, he can safely take the Wind Elevator to the next floor and beat up Hayato and the rest of the enemies. In fact, I get a little too comfortable and accidentally put Mozu in range of a priestess who could kill her with a bow. In a stroke of luck, Virgil is in range to serve as a distraction, drawing in a Great Master with a Bolt Naginata. Although this results in Virgil's death, the Great Master takes up the space, which protects Mozu from the Priestess. With a renewed sense of fear compounded with PTSD from the Kitsune map, I play slow and safe, grabbing the treasure and Mikasa, the Priestess who could have ended Mozu's life. There are no more capturable Shrine Maidens, but they promote into Priestesses, so they'll do. However, the map's not finished until we defeat the Avatar. He is a Master of Arms, able to bend the Weapon Triangle to his will but he decides to not give himself triangle advantage, which leads to Corrin accidentally performing a dramatic finish by killing him with a dose of lightning bending. In Chapter 21, Corrin's group enters Peach's castle for one final stop before reaching Hoshido, but they are faced with the Eternal Stairway, where the stairs are seemingly endless. As the gang tries to progress, they find themselves caught within Iago's nefarious trap, an infinite amount of faceless pouring in from above and below. Victory can only be achieved by escaping at the top of the map with all of the units deployed, which is easier said than done due to the literal infinite faceless reinforcements and dangerous stoneborn, artificial constructs that can launch rocks at up to 5 spaces away. Fortunately, I can thwart the pincer attack by calling upon the Pillar Men, Benny and the two generals I captured in Chapter 18, Ludwig and Edsel. Benny and the Ludwig-Edsel pair-up can block the southern faceless from advancing further north, with the help of Hitaka's rally defense, Benny and the generals have enough defense to take no damage in combat, so although they'll be worn down to 1 HP with Grizzly Wound and Savage Blow, they are invincible. Now that my rear is clear, I can gradually make progress, using Soul Sophie to smite oncoming Faceless from the north, and using Corrin to bait Stoneborn and debuff them with Draconic Hex. With a system in place to handle all the enemies on the map, Corrin and company can backwards long jump their way through the opposition and reach the top. Only the reinforcements remain, so I use the dragon veins to freeze all enemies and grant the fellas a head start so they can run up the stairs, allowing me to escape with all of my characters alive. 
Well, everyone except Lilith, because she dies in a cutscene for no particular reason. Before we enter Oshido proper, we take a vacation on a romantic cruise liner, so Odin and Elise can spend some quality time together, and finally get to s rank support before Elise finds a new way to put her life at risk. However, Azura and Laszlo's son, Shigure, selfishly crash lands on our ship and draws in his pursuers who are after his life, which is completely ruining the loving vibes here. After shoving Shigure below decks, my army prepares to fend off the ships of berserkers, sorcerers, and adventurers that broadside our ship. The enemies isolate themselves by boarding our ship, making them easy to dispatch and affording Odin and Elise the opportunity to flirt and make goo goo eyes at each other. Once we kill all the invaders, Shigure is safe and recruited. Which is another staff user, I guess. But more importantly, Odin and Elise officially tie the knot and immediately have a daughter named Ophelia. Even though it has literally been minutes, Ophelia is all grown up thanks to the hyperbolic time chamber, and Odin takes her shopping at her school's scholastic book fair. However, trouble brews when the PA system announced that there's only one copy left of Ripley's Believe It or Not Special Edition 2004, so we gear up and kill everyone before they can snatch the book first. I start the map off by using Ophelia's Offspring Seal to promote her into a level 8 sorcerer. Thanks to inheriting Elise's high magic growth, Ophelia makes for a fantastic mage, and she even crits in every combat she took part in in this map. Though, the real reason I went to her paralog was to grab strong tones for Corrin that are otherwise unobtainable in the conquest route. The first, and Corrin's new go to weapon, is the Horse Spirit, bestowing plus 3 to skill, speed, defense, and resistance, which has about the same defensive bonus as granted by the Dragonstone, but without any of the drawbacks. By turn 7, all of the enemies have become aggressive and rushed my position, but my army is strong enough to decimate an entire group of powerful promoted enemies on player phase, leaving just the boss and a priestess. This gives me time to pick up the other important weapon, Calamity Gate, which gives core and weapon triangle advantage over blue weapons. To end the map, I capture the boss Seno, but he pales in comparison to our much more important capture, Yayoi the Priestess. Since I'm on a roll, I enter Paralogue 21 to pick up Lazo and Azura's other child, Soleil. She's an offensive juggernaut with high strength and speed, and will make for a perfect addition to the team. Because if there's anyone who can appreciate a woman who can clone herself, Niles' collection of maidens, and Sophie's ability to strip ladies of their clothing, it's Soleil. Wow. Cute. Um, hi. This map contains two obstacles, which can be picked up in place to block enemies from moving through a path. The player is incentivized to stand their ground in the center and protect Soleil's band of four lancers to get rewarded with some goodies if they live, by instead fly Laszlo to pick up his daughter and push all my units to the northwest corner. I use the two obstacles to mostly enclose myself in, which consequently leaves all the lancers for dead. Due to my placement of the obstacles, there's only one path that connects the northwest to the rest of the map, but that can easily be blocked off by Corrin, who only takes a smidgen of damage or none at all because of the bonuses granted by his two wives and horse spirit. I can't get too comfortable yet, as some of the enemies have paths. Sophie can quite comfortably dispatch the past bow knights with their forged umbrella, and the boss, Zara, ends up deleting himself on Corrin, which is a little unfortunate because now I can't capture him but at least he can keep Virgil company on the death tracker. Now that the passers have passed on, I can feed the remaining foes to my army for some juicy EXP. Smile. You're dead. With three more child super soldiers added to my now overleveled army, I'm ready to conquer Hoshido. Chapter 22 begins the series of chapters where you must defeat the Hoshidan royal family in ascending age order, starting with the youngest, Sakura. Although the chapter is named after her, she and her retainers are just supporting the chapter's true boss, Yukimura, in repelling the Norians from Fort Jinya. The map splits up your army and intends for each half to assist each other with dragon veins to open up paths, but I just pair up everyone on the left side and go in with brute force. This side is Hana's domain, though she and her entourage won't become aggressive until engaged, so I break a wall and funnel my army through as Korn stays back to waste Sakura's staves. Once I'm set up, Ophelia triggers Hana's group by electrocuting an unsuspecting blacksmith through a wall, though she's far too frail to remain at this spot, so I move her back to safety and replace her with Sophie via shelter, dance, and transfer shenanigans. I am successful in disrupting their formation, leaving Hana alone as an easy target for Felicia to strike down. 
All that's left is to have Mozu and her cheerleader boyfriend Arthur defeat Yukimura and seize the gate. But I decided to stick around for a turn and defeat the rest of the named characters. Sorry, Sakura. The next chapter features Takami. Instead of using some dinky little fort like his little sister, Takami sits atop the Great Wall of China in this Japanese-inspired setting. First, we need to reach the wall, but a group of lunge enemies stand in our way. Lunge will swap the positions of the attacker and target after combat, which can only be prevented if the target kills the lunger. Although Camilla cannot kill the Pissar on the counterattack, I placed her on the flyer-only lake tile, making it impossible for him to activate Lunge. Now that the initial wave of enemies are willing to advance towards my army, I make short work of them and then contemplate how I want to approach Hinata and his retinue of Ralliers, who will stand there menacingly until someone crosses the bridge. I opt for a blitz, starting with my own rallies and shuffling Azura to safety, I then freeze the Sniper and Spearmaster pair-ups with Shigure and Elise leaving just four mobile foes. Camilla kills the leftmost Spearmaster and takes a spot with Lunge, placing her right next to the Sniper para. After Corrin handles the Sniper on the right, Camilla becomes completely safe because the Frozen Snipers and Benny prevent her from being attacked on enemy phase. Everything goes according to plan, as Hanada leaves his gate tile to attack Corrin, and the Spearmaster can hardly scratch Benny. With the hole punched in his retinue and his positioning screwed, Hinata and everyone else below the wall goes down. The wall reintroduces the stairs gimmick from chapter 11, but anyone who goes up the western stairs will be greeted by lunge spearmasters, who can drag your units into a Boros group. The eastern stairs are just outside of the lunger's range, but will remain inaccessible as long as the Basaras stand on top of them. To remedy this, Camilla takes the available stairs, flies over the ballista, and opens up the Basra's skull and one of the stairways. I then use one charge of the rescue rod to save Camilla's life and send Corrin up to retain control. The Lunger's and Oboros group approach, but they lack object permanence, so they return back to their starting positions if I run back down the stairs. By embracing the peekaboo gameplay, I have achieved complete control over the map, and the rest of the chapter becomes a joke as I easily gank a Boro and Takumi. Wanting to avoid getting captured, Takumi sets himself on fire, then employs the stop, drop, and roll technique. He stops on top of the wall, then drops himself off of it, and rolls away. Supposedly, because we can't actually find his body. Takumi may have gone away, but we did capture Kazunari, the infamous rally man with four rally skills, and Ukiyo, the spearmaster next to Hanada, three rally skills, and Amaterasu. The next leaf to pluck in the Hoshiden royal family tree is Hinoka. As opposed to being cooped up in a fortress, Hinoka faces us on an open field. The map is teeming with flying enemies, which is concerning on its own, but Hinoka will activate Dragon Veins that buffs flyer movement by 50% while reducing non-flyer movement by half. The opposing Falcon and Kinshi Knights are too dangerous with 12 movement, so I activate my own Dragon Vein to reverse the effects. With Corrin's newfound 10 movement, he and Felicia dart over to stand between the Western enemies and Shigure. While Korin is busy horsing around with Setsuna and her group of grounded units, the rest of my army use the enemy phase to hunt the four movement flyers. The Bolt Naginata Falcon Knights are smacked down by Niles and the newly reclassed Master of Arms Mozu, and the Kinshi Knights get countered by my Paladins. Xander has to rely on his special personal sword to succeed, but all Sophie needs is her umbrella, and arguably does the job better. After two more turns of Korin non lethally defeating the rest of the aggressive grounded units with lethality, Two blocks of flying reinforcements surge in, but I can slow them down with another Dragon Vein. I afford myself the chance to capture Koromo, a Falcon Knight with Pass, who will later prove integral to beating the game. After Xander, of all people, manages to evade and single-handedly deplete Azama's Hexing Rod, not much is left to stand in my way, and Mozu can one-shot Hinoka with a Beast Killer. Although I could seize and end the map now, I stick around for a bit and tango with the reinforcements until Mozu finishes learning the Master of Arms skills, so I can return her back to a bow-wielding class. After we seize, Hinoka accepts her defeat and the fate that awaits her, but Korin instead hits her with a stack of paper. These papers are for the Witness Protection Program, as Korin wants Hinoka and her retainers to disappear in order to convince Garen that he has slayed them. Hinoka protests, wanting to tag along and explain everything to Ryoma, but Ryoma's a reasonable man. 
Surely we can talk it out, Pete. Rayoma has no interest in talking to us, and instead drags Korin into a chamber alone and challenges him to a duel. Despite being blinded by rage over the perceived deaths of his family, he will still wait patiently for 20 turns. Although Korin can fight Ryoma without any risk of losing his life, it will take forever for Korin to defeat Ryoma alone, due to his low hit rate and the chamber's healing and damage reduction. If anyone can bail Korin out of this situation, it's his wife. The only way for the rest of my army to break to the chamber is to defeat Saizo and Kagero, but that would entail the nigh impossible task of trudging through enemies with inevitable end, so I instead remain the starting area and arrange my army to support Felicia. Although Felicia's defense stat clocks in at, um, 8, through the cumulative support from a variety of tonics, General Benny's pair-up stat bonuses, Ukio, Kazunari, and Niles' combined rallies, Laszlo's fancy footwork, Azura's inspiring song, Corin's draconic hex against Rayoma, Elisa's Lily's poise, Jacob's jantiome, Replica Felicia's inspiration, and weapon triangle advantage, Rayoma can only deal 20 damage to Felicia, with a paltry 29% hit and no crit chance. Unless Rayoma procs Astra and lands all 5 hits, Felicia is guaranteed to survive against Rayoma. Amusingly, she's fast enough to double and has superb accuracy, even in the face of Duelist Blow. After healing back up to full and reapplying all the rallies, Felicia activates Lethality, which should instantly kill Rayoma, but he is literally too angry to die. Forced to fight him normally, Felicia eventually applies enough deep tissue acupuncture to knock Rayoma out. With Hoshido now rendered defenseless, Korin urges his father to seize the throne, but he refuses to do so until Korin deals the final blow on Rayoma. Do like it. the umpteenth other times no. King Garen orders Korin to kill, a drawn-out back-and-forth conversation it. takes place, no. but before they realize it, Felicia's lethality do hit from earlier finally works its way through Rayoma's system and kicks in, which compels Rayoma to brandish his Raijinto and commit Sudoku. Thanks, babe. In one last detour, we enter Paralogue 2, which features Corin and Felicia's daughter, Kana. Although I could have picked up Kana since Chapter 10, I strategically neglected her until right now in order to have an easy source of EXP to train Mozu to max level. The map consists of individual groups of enemies that only become aggressive when provoked. By filling the moats, the enemies will be forced to funnel on the bridges, meaning I have complete control over who fights which enemies, no risk of getting overwhelmed. Mozu is my ticket to reliably completing Conquest's endgame, but she won't be powerful enough until she learns the rest of her class skills, first learning Spendthrift as a merchant, then reclassing one last time into a sniper, reaching max level and learning Bowfair. As a thank you for attracting a bunch of strong invaders for our army to train off of, Kana can finally join our group. Even though she inherits her mother's funny replicate skill, our twin Kanas will remain neglected on the bench because the final maps are too demanding and do not require their services. In Chapter 26, there is no more Hoshiden opposition, but we've yet to resolve all our conflicts. Iago and Hans do away with the subterfuge, traps, and indirect threats to Korn's life and just straight up attack him. Finally, we can dispose of these nuisances, but of course they don't make reaching them easy. We must open doors to make progress and choose whether to take the western path with Stoneborn and Faceless, or the eastern path with Sorcerers and Maids. Iago and the Maids all have the skill Staff Savant, which grants infinite staff uses, letting them entrap, enfeeble, and freeze as much as they please. I let Felicia get entrapped in order to retaliate and take the nearby entrapper off the board. Although Felicia is separated from the main group, I can still remotely heal and buffer through Replica Felicia, who is left in the rest of my army's care. Next, I need to bring the squad over to Felicia and Corrin, so I open the door to a horde of Jack counter heroes with some generic ninja named Kays, who I don't remember ever capturing, but eh, whatever. Once I light up the heroes from a non counterable distance, I tiptoe around Iago's staff range and reunite the two Felicias. The Stoneborn and Faceless are far too menacing, so I make use of Felicia's superb resistance to permanently silence the sorcerers. In fact, she's a bit too good at her job, and scares away the remaining sorcerers who bore witness to the carnage. But their cowardice can only prolong their lives for so long. In order to make any more progress, someone must open the door to the bottom room. 
Yukari, the Lock Touch Shrine Maiden from Chapter 17, makes the ultimate sacrifice, opening the floodgates of high powered generals and preservers. Camilla with Benny and Corrin with Felicia hold the line. Camilla's hammer and high defense spook the generals so much that they won't attack, which keeps her safe from the Berserkers and simultaneously ushers them to attack Corrin, though it's the last thing they ever do. Hans's retinue and accompanying reinforcements begin to approach, but I stop his advance cold with a free staff and deal with his grunts first. Only Hans and Iago remain, and to ensure their deaths are permanent and inescapable, I invoke the Norian legal system. With the combination of Sophie's special power and her status as a child, I can charge Hans and Iago with the crime of indecent exposure in front of a minor. In order to make these charges stick, I've gone through the effort of having Niles collect six maids, Beatrice, Ursula, Ernesta, Gisela, Carlene, and Stella, as witnesses, providing irrefutable testimony to implicate the nudists and sentence them to the death penalty. Even though Iago and Hans are no more, and I have a prison full of new maids for the collection, I can obtain an even greater victory with the single-use legendary staff, Bifrost. I have the hindsight to deploy Brahmi, the maid captured from Chapter 18, who has the necessary staff rank to use it and resurrect Yukari, preserving the sanctity of this run by protecting all my shrine maidens. With the second coming of Yukari seizing the throne, I can exit the map with my head held high as I emerge victorious without losing anything of value. In Chapter 27, the kids enter Father's room to deliver the news about Iago and Hans, but we catch Garen unawares before he can put on his makeup, revealing his true form as a grotesque sludge monster. The Norian siblings initially don't believe this can be their father, but are then convinced once they get smacked, because they can recognize that ass beating from anywhere. After Corrin provides a persuasive plea pertaining to patricide, we band together to dethrone the king. As if capped enemies with OP skills weren't enough, this map has shrine mains with infinite range and trap staffs that serve to separate your army. However, I can exploit their AI by deploying only 4 units and running into the bottom left room. Since we are treated as in a room, they will not target us with a trap and instead do nothing. Boots Boosted Sniper Mozu can one-shot the room's Master Ninja with ease thanks to her skills, Certain Blow, Quick Draw, Life and Death, Spendthrift, and Bowfin, and being supported by her sugar daddy husband, Berserker Arthur. Defeating the Master Ninja opens up the door to the stairs, allowing me to outmaneuver the rest of the enemies and reach Garen. After softening Garen up with Korn's spiffy new Shadow Yato we got from the preceding cutscene, Mozu gets more gold bars from Arthur, and can bust out the Crescent Bow, letting her attack up to four times in a single combat. Garen literally evaporates, and the game has seemingly run out of characters that could possibly pick a fight with us, but Takumi rolls into the throne room, still burning from the purple flame on him. Welp, as long as Korin has his horse spirit equipped, he'll have enough defense to tank anything Takumi could attack him with- Wait, Korin switched to a sword in the last fight. Uh-oh. After a whole dream sequence with his departed Hoshiden family, Korin comes back to life, but considering the hell that is Endgame, he should have just remained dead. Between infinite exploding faceless and gigantic shockwaves that can bring my army down to 1 HP, and inevitable end staff savant maids that can literally drop a unit's stats to zero, this map is a brutal bloodbath and a gargantuan spike in difficulty. Fortunately, I can skip all of this with a rescue chain to ferry in a dedicated Takami killer which, in my case, is Mozu. After Arthur takes the enfeeble hit for his beloved, turn 2 begins, and I put the plan into action. Itaka uses Swap on Arthur, moving him down enough so Mozu can build Shield Gauge on the Oni Chieftains. I ensure she uses the Shining Bow, which prevents her from critting and potentially one-shotting before generating 6 shields. Sophie brings a Zurin range to dance for Mozu, but she's still too far away from Takami. Fortunately, I took great care in preserving my rescue rods, letting Yukari rescue Kuromo. Then, Kuromo can make use of her pass skill to move through enemy lines and rescue Mozu to be in striking distance of Takami. The first two hits of the Crescent Bow will fill the rest of her shield gauge, saving her from getting vengeance on retaliation. Takami will generate enough shield gauge to block the fourth hit, but Mozu's skills and the plus eight strength from her husband Arthur empowers her enough to kill and rain justice on the third hit bringing the Conquest Iron Man to a close. 
Fire Emblem Fates Conquest was the first Fire Emblem game I ever played, and my introduction to the series. I couldn't beat this on lunatic difficulty as a kid, so to come back with years worth of Fire Emblem experience and finally succeed in an Iron Man setting has been a cathartic experience. Excluding the Kitsune and Final Maps, Lunatic Conquest generally maintains a good level of challenge, constantly pushing the player and keeping them on their toes. Although not always in the spotlight, Felicia was the star of the show, setting itself apart by taking full advantage of the Fates class system. The entire run was built around getting Replicate on her early, and she was a fantastic asset, both in the front lines and as support. Anyway, I streamed the entire Iron Man here on my YouTube channel, so if you want the full experience, check out the VOD playlist. Since you've made it here, why don't you make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any future videos, hit that like button, and leave a comment, and then use your Replicate skill to subscribe, like, and comment again. Or, if you don't have Replicate, sharing the video works just as well, too. Now, if you don't mind, I have a couple of Felicias to attend to.